Now we can look at electrolytes. So, so far we've just been looking at non-electrolytes, things that don't dissociate into ions when you put them in water. But we do have um, electrolytes, and so what has, how is that going to change the colligative properties? So colligative properties depend on the, the number of particles that you have. So if you have something that dissociates into ions, so something like sodium chloride. So think about sodium chloride. Whoa, what happened there? Sodium chloride, when you put that in water, there we go. NaCl is going to dissociate into sodium. And chloride ions. So uh, if it completely dissociates, you're going to get two particles there. So you should have twice as much of an effect on um, the colligative property. Because now you have, instead of one mole of things, now you have two. Um, so in, in, you know, really does this happen completely? No, because some of these molecules are going to, some of these ions are going to reassociate, so you don't really get 100% dissociation. Um, but we're going to take the, the limiting value there. We'll take the maximum and say something like sodium chloride will dissociate. It's a strong electrolyte, right? It's a soluble ionic compound. It's going to dissociate into two particles. So we're going to add something here, this Van Hoff factor, onto the end of this equation. And really we're just multiplying it by the moles. So since molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent, you're really multiplying the mole the number of moles of particles you have by this Van Hoff factor, which is how many particles it dissociates into. So let's look at a couple of these um, and try to figure out, you know, how does, how does this change the, <clears throat> the freezing point? Um, so it says list the following aqueous solutions in order their expected freezing point. So you can see you have different types of compounds, you have different molalities, and so you're, you're looking at that relationship between, you know, what's the Van Hoff factor? How many particles does this thing dissociate into? And then what is the molality? And then you can calculate the delta Tf. Now, the bigger the delta T, the lower the freezing point, right? Because the freezing point's always going to go down. So if you have a big change from zero, then you're going to have a much lower freezing point. So that's kind of what we're going to look at in this column. So calcium chloride, if you think about what calcium chloride really looks like, let's just try to find the Van Hoff factors for all these guys. So calcium chloride is going to dissociate into calcium ions and two chloride ions, right? So if you think about what he looks like, you have a calcium and then you have a chloride and a chloride. That's three particles, right? You have two chlorides, two chlorides and one calcium. So that's three. So this guy has a Van Hoff factor of three. Uh, sodium chloride, we already said, has a Van Hoff factor of two. HCl is a strong acid, so it's a strong electrolyte, so that will also dissociate into, into two particles. Um, now acetic acid, this is a weak acid. So if you remember anything about weak things, they don't dissociate completely, they dissociate partially. And we're going to do a whole chapter on um, acids and bases, and we'll look at this, this guy again. But a weak one means it's either, it's going to be somewhere between one particle and two, but definitely not two, and definitely a little bit more than one, so it's somewhere in between those two. We'll do a max and a min um, for, the, for this guy. And this last one is just sucrose. It's, it's just a molecular compound. It's not going to dissociate at all, so the Van Hoff factor is just one. So if it's just one particle, right, if I was just one, it, that means it's a non-electrolyte, so our original equation works for non-electrolytes. Non the only thing we're doing now is adding on this Van Hoff factor for electro electrolytes. All right, so now all I, all I want to do is multiply the Van Hoff factor by the molality. And have that done here. So this guy, so you can do that. So just 3 times 0.05 is 0 0.15, 0 0.30, 0.20. And then this one is either going to be 0 0.05 all the way up to 0.1, and then this one will be 0.1. So all I'm doing is multiplying the Van Hoff factor, this column, by whatever number is in front of here, those molalities. And then you can also find the delta Tf, the change in the freezing point. And whichever number is the biggest, that's the lowest freezing point. Whichever number is the smallest means it's going to be closest to zero. It's going to be closest to, to water. It's not really a big change in freezing point. It'll actually have the highest freezing point. So this one you get 0.279 and then 0.5. Again, you can always pause the video just to work out this math and then check it when you're done. 372, 0.093, all the way up to 0.186 and 0 0.186. All right, so if, that, if the acetic acid one, this one's confusing you a little bit, we don't know exactly what the Van Hoff factor is for that guy. They don't give it to us in the problem. So we're kind of approximating it, somewhere between 1 and 2. So you're going to get a range for all these things. All right, so whoever has the biggest freezing point depression has the lowest freezing point. So that would be sodium chloride. That's going to have the lowest freezing point. Um, and then who? 
and then comes this one, HCl, in this case. Again, the freezing point depends on the Van Hoff factor, so it depends on how many moles of your solute you have, um, as well as the, the molality, right? So molality and the, and the Van Hoff factor will affect the freezing point. Everybody has the same Kf, right, because this is in water, which depends on the solvent. Then we had HCl, then we had what, CaCl2, and then sucrose, C12H22O11, and then the highest one would be the acetic acid. All right, so again, the bigger the freezing point depression, the bigger that delta T, the lower the freezing point is going to be.